Thank you all for joining us for this collaborative program presented by IIT's Mies van der Rohe Society in partnership with IIT's College of Architecture and the Cliff Dwellers Club. It's a pleasure to be here at the Cliff Dwellers Club. Um, I, I'm proud to say I am both a member of the Mies van der Rohe Society as well as a very longtime member of the club itself. The club with its fascinating history, ideal location and generous and warm hospitality is a perfect, almost salon-like setting for our program tonight. So I'm, I'm very happy we're all here together. As you may know, the Mies van der Rohe Society is dedicated to supporting the preservation of Ludwig von, I'm sorry, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe's legacy and maintaining the architectural integrity of his and other buildings on the campus of the Illinois Institute of Technology. As we all know, architecture and design enthusiasts come from across the globe to see the historic modern campus, largely designed by Mies in the 1940s and 1950s, as well as the bold newer works by architect by, of architecture, <laughs> newer works of architecture designed by Rem Poolhouse. Helmut Jahn, John Ronan, and others. Preserving and celebrating the campus and its legacy is our goal, so that IIT can continue to provide a setting that inspires generation of design and technology enthusiasts to come. It's now my pleasure to turn the microphone over to the executive director of the Mies Society, Cynthia Varanis Olson, who will share more about tonight's presenter, John Sung Kim, a dear friend and leading member of the Mies Society, who notably studied with Mies van der Rohe, then early in his distinguished career, went to work in Mies's office. Please welcome Cynthia Baranis Olson to tell us more. Thank you, Zurich. Zurich puts our programs together in such a beautiful way. And we're so happy to have not only Zurich, but several of our board members, past chair Steve Weiss, Ed Pollack, um, George Sorich, and uh, Kristen Jones. Several faculty members um, have come tonight. Uh, the president of Vandercook, and by the way, you heard Vandercook College of Music faculty playing um, French inspired music. Thank you. We have friends and family of um, Professor Kim and Ernie Eisenminger, just to uh, give you um, sort of a perspective about how important the Mies Society is to IIT. Um, Ernie is our VP of Advancement. And Ernie, would you stand? You give us so much support. We thank you so much. The Mies Society resides under constituent engagement, and Dia Marcano is also here today, along with Ariel. Mark Osorio, who, who heads up our buildings at IIT. Mark is an alum. So we have this rich kind of fabric, Eric from our bookstore. So don't forget to please uh, grab a copy of these beautiful books. Um, so I think Professor Kim is probably the punctual type, so I better begin. <laughs> um, Isabel David, a very good friend. I just wanna mention and thank her for coming. She's the head of the French uh, program uh, in Chicago for, uh, resides at Lincoln Park Elementary School. Um, but uh, here tonight, we're honored to have Professor Jung Sung Kim. And uh, Professor Kim completed his Bachelor of Architecture and Master of Architecture degrees at IIT. He then not only studied with Mies, but he worked at the office of Mies van der Rohe during the 1960s and taught architectural design for over a dozen years until 1978 when he organized the architectural design practice, SAC International in Seoul. Over the next 30 years, he would lead this practice to finish building accomplishments such as the weightlifting gym for the 1988 Seoul Olympics, the Sanjay Museum of Contemporary Art, the Aju University Hospital, the Hilton Hotel International in Seoul, and headquarters building for SK Corporation in Seoul. Professor has taught a it has been a regular speaker for architectural conferences in Seoul, um, uh, Korea, the U.S. and Australia, and has been a, a jury member on numerous international competitions such as the Grand Egyptian Museum Competition of 2002-3. He was also commissioner of the Korean Pavilion Architectural Exhibition for the Venice Biennale. 
um, served as organizing committee chair uh, for Docomomo Conference in Seoul, and his architectural accomplishments were featured at the Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Korea, 2014 to 15. Um, he was also awarded the Order of Merit by the Korean government and the Korean Institute of Architects gold medal in 2014. He is a fellow of both the American Institute and the Korean Institute of Architects. Um, but now he continues to teach. Obviously, he travels. He serves on committees and consults with Dean Reed Kroloff, who sends his, his hearty congratulations and also sends his regrets that he was unable to join us tonight. Um, he serves now for four years on the Mies van der Rohe Society Board and imparts wisdom via historical accounts, stories, critiques on drawings, and shares his wisdom on what it means to preserve architecture on our IIT East campus. So tonight he shares with us his fourth book on early medieval and Romanesque architecture. As, as photo essays in France and explores Romanesque, he has explored Romanesque vocabularies in different countries, in Germany, in England, in Portugal, and Spain, and how they might have traveled, this sort of vocabulary has traveled differently to these different countries. So please join me in welcoming Professor Jung Sung Kim with a, with a, with a rich warm uh, round of applause. Thank you, Cynthia, for your wonderful introduction. Um, my presentation today is a uh, Romanesque architecture in France. And uh, as uh, Cynthia already mentioned, I have uh, done Germany, Belgium, Spain, Portugal, uh, Italy, and Croatia. And uh, this is the fourth. And, uh, I'm pleased to tell you that uh, in spring, perhaps in April, uh, I plan to publish England. <laughs> so that will uh, wind up my study of uh, Romanesque architecture. And uh, I need to tell you why Romanesque. I, during my undergraduate days, uh, my uh, passion, passionate, teacher of history, Alfred Caldwell, spent fully one semester on Gothic architecture. So when I graduated finally and uh, went to Europe, uh, I covered most of the Gothic masterpieces and uh, especially the nave of Amiens uh, left me a you know, really deep impression, but then, as I went back to uh, some of these uh, Gothic monuments, uh, the later phase of a Gothic begin, began to um, add on to many things, pinnacles, tabernacles, and the spires. And uh, you know there were too many extraneous elements. And then that's when I began to look at older uh, monuments. Uh, going back about 200 years from uh, Amiens, Amiens Navy is dated 1 to 2 0. So I went back to about 1000, <laughs> began to see some of the older buildings, which was basically left alone after doing the, the necessary tectonic, what supports the weight and the, how the uh, spaces uh, covered, sometimes uh, with a barrel board. And of course, everything um, started with a wooden truss, but then a barrel, and then eventually a uh, groin bolt and all that. So that's how I got into a Romanesque. And uh, since uh, our friend from uh, IIT Bookstore, Eric, is here, 
if you are interested, you can uh, purchase book, not necessarily today, but then Eric has all the, you know, of four volumes. And I especially recommend the first volume in which my younger uh, colleague, Yi Sung Yi, Cornell and Harvard educated architect, he wrote us a short essay outlining why Romanesque and modernism have a certain sort of a spiritual, um, you know, uh, sameness. So I recommend uh, his essay. And coming back to today's book, uh, for example, when I buy a book, I usually skip an introduction by some other person and go into a main chapter. But then this time, uh, you know, more than the prefaces of uh, my first three books, um, the introduction by uh, Barry Bergdorf, uh, I recommend that you read that. I think that is a history of Romanesque architecture, you know, in five pages. And if he did add some illustrations, that would make a wonderful book on Romanesque architecture by itself. <laughs> this is a pure stroke of luck that uh, uh, Barry Bogdor, uh, whom I met several years back, uh, and uh, the publisher, uh, Ernst Vasmus, agreed on asking Barry Bogdor to write a preface this time. And uh, of course, we have had um, uh, Fritz Neumeyer for Spain and Portugal, who wrote a very perceptive and poetical uh, preface. And then I had um, uh, Wilfried Wang to write uh, preface on the first book. And then uh, Gerwin Zolan, the co-publisher of the of Vasmus Zolan, who himself is a critic, and he wrote a very, uh, very generous um, introduction for Italian and Croatia. But then I must tell you, Barry Bogdor, uh, it was a pure coincidence that uh, I asked him, uh, Ernst uh, Vasmus and I, but then he had a fat dossier on Romanesque book. So, uh, you know, he was ready to write this. <laughs> and uh, uh, you will find it uh, very illuminating and uh, entertaining also. So I recommend that. So with that, I start. Um, on this uh, cover photograph, I left my tripod just to show that I'm, I am there taking the photograph. <laughs> um, I had uh, 14 main chapters devoted to our churches, but then in uh, putting together these uh, 14, there were too many uh, other churches which did not really, uh, you know, uh, sort of a warrant uh, dedicating a main chapter, but then too important to leave out. So I show some of these things uh, first. On the left, uh, Arc, Saint Trophim. Saint Trophim, the facade and uh, the portal, uh, that is a very old, 10th century or 11th century. But then the tympanum, please look at the tympanum. Uh, and the, that uh, requires a whole book dedicated to it in medieval sculptural art. So uh, if you travel, because this is uh, on the you know track of a uh, main uh, tourist uh, attraction of a uh, medieval art in France, you cannot miss Arles. So when you uh, pass through Arles, uh, make, make a point of looking at the center of him. The interior uh, sort of a kept up 
uh, redoing so that the interior is a little too much of a um, uh, melange. So I did not uh, choose a central theme for one of the main chapters, but then uh, this tympanum, uh, I could not leave out. So that's how it is. On the right, Moasak. Moasak may not be as uh, you know uh, frequently traveled place, but then Moasak is also very important uh, monument in the medieval art. And uh, this monastery of Saint Pierre, uh, while it was begun as a Romanesque, uh, the interior became Gothic, and that's why it was left out of the main chapter. Nevertheless, look at the Timphalum, uh, uh, Christ in majesty, the main, main figure. And then especially the, the post, I do not have a pointer, but then the main post, there is a figure of uh, Isaiah, sort of uh, figuratively and uh, physically wrapping around the middle post and the uh, amazing piece of uh, sculptural art. Uh, on the left, uh, Germini de Pre. This is um, probably only about 20 kilometers from Orléans. And uh, that building was built within a year or two of uh, uh, Charlemagne's chapel in Aachen, 807 or 808. Charlemagne's Chapel, dated 805. So that piece of um, little um, oratory, uh, in the main chapter, you will see the interior too, but then um, uh, it's a very um, um, sort of a, a very uh, basic forms. But then that cross-shaped plan, how the uh, cross-shaped arms project. And uh, in the middle is a crossing tower, of course. And then half round apses on all four sides. On the right, uh, I have um, one Cistercian monastery in the main chapter. The, uh, main uh, chapter has a Le Tourne. But then Fontenay, uh, Sister Shan Abbey, unfortunately or fortunately, it is in private hands. So you have to pay a huge admission in order to visit. But then uh, to understand Sister Shan architecture, uh, you cannot leave out Fontenay. So I included some photographs of Fontenay. These two uh, shots of um, Puy en Voulay, uh, Cathedral Notre Dame. Uh, that area is a volcanic area, very dark gray stone mixed with a, a beige stone. And uh, the exterior is in a very narrow alley. So that's about the best that I could do with the facade on the right. But then I'm showing on the left, the crossing of uh, Le Puyon Valley uh, Cathedral. And uh, using the vocabulary of uh, uh, Romanesque, the builders, uh, used their ingenuity to create uh, this amazing space. Uh, these uh, two shots of the same picture, same church, Notre Dame la Grande, meaning uh, in that town of Poitiers, there is a, a small Notre Dame also. And uh, here I wanted to um, highlight the regional uh, variations of Romanesque art. There is a sort of a Poitiers region. Uh, I guess there is an adjective, uh, Poitou, Poitou region. 
they had this um, uh, sort of a wealth of um, uh, imagination and uh, the required craftsmanship to produce this amazing facade on the right. And I don't think there is any other Romanesque structure which has as much of a sort of a, you know, flamboyance. And then the same church on the left, uh, in Poitou region, there was this tradition of a, a stockoing and then painting the inside to emulate marble work for marble. So that is a one example of a how colorful that can be. While if you look at closely, the vaulting is very, very, uh, you know, typical Romanesque, uh, half round arches on each bay and then growing vault uh, within each bay. But then this four marble uh, creates um, amazing sense of a fantasy and the mystery. Now I start my main chapter and I start with the Vesle uh, in Burgundy. And uh, when I first went to visit Vesle in 1968, that was the year of a, a student uprising everywhere. And then when I went to France, uh, I think um, I, we, uh, we meaning Arthur Takeuchi and I, we drove a small Volkswagen and then we ran into uh, these um, you know, student protests <laughs> in different places. And uh, that's when I visited um, Besle and that is my first uh, sort of um, uh, introduction to Besle. And uh, this particular facade, I chose to show in the main book uh, instead of a restored, brand new looking facade, which I was shocked to discover last March. Uh, so in the book itself, I have a small picture of uh, the older restored facade, which is like, a, you know, seeing a newly built building. But then I chose to stay with the, this, uh, sort of a thousand year old patina on the right. And of course, uh, the main nave uh, with the two colored uh, stones uh, creating half round uh, transverse uh, arch and then very faint uh, growing vault for each bay. For Vesle, again, the sculptural art uh, would demand that I devote the entire book on the sculpture. And this is in the narthex, very spacious narthex. And um, the Timpanum uh, Christ in Majesty. And uh, that's amazing piece of sculpture. And uh, you will find it in the main uh, chapter. Uh, for this. On the right, again, this is uh, the photograph before the restoration. And uh, I want to point out the flying buttress or the very primitive form of a flying buttress was the work of a young Violet Le Duc, who just graduated from Ecole des Beaux-Arts and uh, became a government architect. And he was given the task of restoring uh, decaying Vesle. And uh, he chose to bring in um, the structural device of a flying buttress, but then obviously very, very uh, heavy and a little primitive, but then that's how it was with the uh, Viola Le Duc. The second, uh, church that I introduced in uh, Autun, uh, Cathedral Saint-Lazare, 
during the Middle Ages, there was a misunderstanding that uh, this Saint Lazar uh, was widely thought to be the contemporary of Jesus, but that was not it. But then because of that uh, sort of um, legend, Otom became a huge um, sort of um, pilgrimage site and it necessitated building a new cathedral. And um, what's impressive about Otom, some of the later editions became uh, Gothic. Look at the nave on the left. The compound pier with the sort of a, um, fluted columns, it's a straight out of a Roman ruins. So the word Romanesque, Rome, Rom, Roman, and I think uh, more than any other church, uh, this uh, Saint Lazar in Autun, uh just uh, uh, you know you see a Roman uh, ruin everywhere in the interior, and uh, the tympanum on the west facade, and uh, the sculptor audaciously, or rather, you know, uh, uh, how would I say, rather disrespectfully, he chiseled his name. <laughs> so the historians know uh, Giselle Bertrus, uh, who carved his name at one corner of the sculpture. <laughs> um, the eastern facade of uh, Saint Lazare in Autun, uh, you think it is a Gothic structure, which it is. The exterior is Gothic, while the inside stayed Romanesque. One of the very famous sculptured capital in Autun, I think uh, this one you'll. Uh, I may be confused, but then this is a uh, uh, Ganymedes. I think that depiction of that. Uh -huh. uh, I'm still in the you know mid middle region of uh, France, Paris Le Monial, and uh, this is a, a Basilique du Sacré Coeur, and uh, I'd like to uh, point. Uh, the eastern facade first on the right. And uh, this is a sort of a miniature version of uh, the demolished um, Cluny. Now, Cluny was demolished, but then when uh, Paris Le Monial was built, uh, I think the uh, patron uh, cleric told his master builders to model it after Cluny. So this is a miniature version of Cluny, which we now know through archeological studies only. But then uh, this gives a very good idea of um, uh, the shue of a uh, French Romanesque, uh, which is not sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, done in uh, the Northern countries, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium and uh, France, not in the southern regions either. In, in Italy, you do not see uh, this radiating uh, chapels and uh, you know, very sculptural dynamic uh, massing. And uh, this Paray Lumonial uh, is uh, one of the best example of how French Romanesque uh, did. Um, the view on the left of a nave that was a soon after restoration. It is as if uh, it was built by contemporary architects, you know, you know, within the uh, our century or something. So that restoration has a rather disturbing effect of um, just taking away a thousand years of age. But then uh, it is a very elegant. Uh, interior. The small chapel on the left is a late Gothic, obviously, and uh, uh, you cannot avoid in a Romanesque church 
uh, this uh, later editions, uh, incorporating a, a, you know, the most advanced building technique. So in a Romanesque structure, uh, the master builders who were given the task of adding on a chapel by the you know client, uh, usually the patron, uh, you know the clerics, uh, they uh, did not see any virtue in staying with the same style, but then they uh, built in the way that they knew how to best uh, build. So that's how it is, late Gothic chapel. And on the right is um, a very characteristic uh, three-part uh, organization of the interior. Uh, this is um, a small town in middle region of uh, France, Tourneux, T-O-U-R-N-U-S, and uh, I know uh, the uh, standard French will say Tourney, but then when I went to Paris one year to buy a train ticket and asked to the, you know, the guy who sells the ticket, I said Tourney. He says Tourneys. He's pronounced as. <laughs> so this tiny Abbey Church. Um, I think what is important about Truni is um, the vaulting technique uh, shown on the left. Instead of uh, doing a barrel vault moving in the same direction, the builder did the barrel vault doing in a compartment each bay. And um, I believe it was uh, never repeated by, by later builders because of uh, its uh, sort of uh, unfavorable acoustic quality. Apparently the music broke down inside. And I think more visually important is uh, instead of unifying the space, from back of the nave to the altar. I think it broke the length of the space into a small compartments. So it was never repeated. But then I think this is a very important uh, uh, experiment in uh, Romanesque building art. So this is the view. It's not uh, all that obvious because of uh, you know the uh, three dimensional quality is not visible but then you can see that uh, each bay is doing this um le tourne le tourne is um, important to most of us architects because um uh, the client of uh, Le Corubigier's uh, La Tourette Monastery, uh, Father Couturier, told Le Corubigier to study Le Tourne. And uh, Le Corubigier did visit and then left a little remark. It's in the text. And um, so that's how uh, I was uh, intrigued to look at it. And I visited Le Tourne several times and it was important enough to warrant a main chapter. So you will find uh, Le Tourne. On the left, uh, the emblematic, uh, very uh, sturdy proportioned, not elegant. <laughs> How that uh, you know arch is very heavy. How thick and uh, that the center column is so fat and a little tiny uh, capital above. And uh, that's the sort of a quality of a uh, uh, In a very, uh, very difficult site, the builder who is nameless, of course. Uh, I would say 90% of the time, 
we do not know the name of uh, these builders, but then I think the builder, especially of uh, Le Tourne, uh, he was really a creative person. All right, we come to Normandy uh, and the Khan, city of Khan, Saint Etienne. William the Conqueror, after you know, conquering England, he sort of uh, chose to be buried uh, at you know back in Normandy. So this is where uh, William the Conqueror rests. Uh, Khan. And uh, going back to my earlier, uh, you know, recommendation of uh, you reading the preface by Harry Bogdol. Uh, according to Bogdol, Kang is where the first set of a Romanesque structure were published, printed. <laughs> and uh, the name Romanesque or L'Architecture Roman uh, was invented in the city of Khan. If you look at the nave, it is a late sort of Romanesque and the early uh, Gothic, because we see a sex uh bay, uh, the vaulting, which is same uh, that we find in Notre Dame, Paris, uh, and the songs. And uh, that's how the late phase of uh, uh, Romanesque. The exterior, if you forget about the spires on the right, uh, the base of um, Saint Etienne is Romanesque, but then the later builders during the uh, Gothic period uh, built it in a Gothic uh, idiom. On the right, the eastern end of uh, Saint Etienne, Khan. It is a uh, Romanesque. It's it's a uh, sort of a uh, uh, you know there's a very little of a ro uh, Romanesque left. It's about ma mainly Gothic. Mm -hmm. And on the left is um, how the nave was uh, organized. So enough of a Romanesque frame. But then, as the vaulting is already six part height, Gothic vaulting, it is, um, uh, I, I would say, it is more accurate to say uh, Romanesque exterior with uh, Gothic uh, vaulting. This is um, the cover picture, saint bonnois sur loire uh, about uh, 30 kilometers from Orléans. And uh, so this is um, where the relic of uh, Saint Benedict is enshrined. And um, the original Saint Benedict uh, shrine is in Italy, the Abbey of Monte Cassino. But then there was uh, about one century of a uh, period when it was left in ruins after vandalism by different uh, invaders. And uh, some enterprising priests from France went there and then make, uh, made the um, sacred theft <laughs> and uh, brought it to uh, uh, this uh, Abbey of uh, Fleury uh, near Orléans. And uh, later when Monte Cassino was restored, I think one of the popes during that period sort of uh, mediated uh, two uh, abbeys uh, to sort of uh, reconcile the portion of a relic which was taken from Monte Cassino and uh, Fleury will keep it, but then made uh, some compensation in our financial terms, I think. And uh, the one left, uh, I talked about the very you know, authentic French Romanesque interior uh, and the French Romanesque chouet. But then the left is um, uh, that uh, similar to Paris Lumonial. 
somewhat simpler here, and how radiating shepherds, five of them, are placed in the half round uh, apps. Uh -huh. And there is a effigy of uh, Philip the first inside, and it is a very um, sort of a very authentic uh, Romanesque. In other words, the later additions in Gothic idiom uh, is not visible. It's a very a clean Romanesque on the right. Whereas uh, the west facade of uh, Saint Bonnois Sur Loire is a little funny because um, uh, due to some uh, warfare during the War of Roses and all that, uh, one uh, one level was uh, demolished and then it was finished in a sort of a strange way. So this is the view that the, when you visit uh, Saint Bonnois Sur Loire, um, without uh, knowing what uh, is there on the east side, you would not know how good how how good an example of Romanesque architecture this is. So last March, I made an arrangement beforehand with the Abbey uh, to visit the east. And one of the younger uh, novices uh, guided me to the east uh, through the yard. And uh, I was uh, given full sort of a rain <laughs> to do uh, photographing uh, you know, to my uh, you know, heart's content. This is again that uh, Poitou region. Uh, there is this uh, uh, saint Savin. Sur Gartank. Uh, Gartank River and the Saint Savin, uh, Savinius from somewhere in the East, and the, his brother. Two of them fled uh, persecution from East, and uh, they were martyred in this um, town. And uh, the town itself now is named Saint Savin. Sur Gartamp. Here uh, in the main chapter, you will see that uh, uh, I go into more details of uh, framing, but then uh, I think more than the architecture, uh, the fresco in the barrel vault nave surface is what is uh, remarkable. I think this is slightly out of the way, but then if you do uh, uh, travel through uh, France. This is a uh, one destination that uh, you probably want to cover. <laughs> Saint Savin, Sir Gartan. So it has a nickname, uh, Little Sistine Chapel. Oh, amazing, uh, you know, uh, fresco paintings, and. Uh, as I was saying about sculpture, anybody who is studying medieval painting art will have to simply uh, write several books on it. And uh, you know, you have to do away with the, do with the, this uh, little photograph. <laughs> uh, this is a, um, Again, in the middle region, I think uh, the region in France is uh, administratively called the Centre. And there is a town named um, Neuvi. It used to have a short name, Neuvi, but then one priest uh, gave it a name of a uh, Saint Sepulcre, Sepulcre with the extra H in it. Whereas French word Sepulcre is C R E, but then here, Sepulchre, C H R E, meaning beautiful. And um, this is a, a rather unusual uh, centrally planned church. And the column inside, there are nine bays, not eight, not 12, 
and line. And that there is, of course, a very, very uh, important reason for it, uh, which you will find in the uh, main book. And uh, this church began as a small nave uh, of a basilica plan. And then later it had a major centrally planned structure added to it. So now we do not really look at the, the original part, which is on the left. Perigue, uh, saint Front. Um, I think we need to uh, look at the nave space. It's a um, uh, cross, uh, Greek cross, in other words, same uh, transepts, but then the entrance on the west has a one additional bay. And um, I believe it was uh, modeled after San Marco. And uh, I came across reference to it. So you will see that in the uh, main texts, but then uh, it is, a, I think, one of its kind. In France, there are several domed churches, but then this one in Perigueux is um, unique. The facade on the right, uh, I have to tell you that uh, the very uh, sort of a Muslim flavor of uh, saint Front is the work of a Paul Abadi, who is uh, a sacre coeur in Paris. And I think uh, during the tail end of uh, 19th century, Paul Abadi uh, did many restorations, but then he injected his um, uh, predilection for Muslim idiom and uh, all these uh, you know extended um, turrets with uh, elongated uh, pine cone shapes uh, this is rather uh, from our perspective looking at it in the 21st century uh, looks rather strange but then i think uh, the space inside is uh, worth worth looking at i think you need to spend the whole day Incidentally, Perigue is the home of uh, uh, foie gras, <laughs> Perigol. I believe it was uh, not really uh, allowed to, you know, to be sold in some cities in US. I don't know how it is in Chicago, Perigol. <laughs> Two views of the um, uh, Saint Front inside. Now I come to a, a remote city of Conk, Saint Foy. Saint Foy, um, translated in English, is a saint faith. And the faith is the uh, patron saint of uh, prisoners. And it's not on, it's it's not clear whether it is a prisoner who committed a, a felony or whether it's a prisoners of a, you know some conflict. But then uh, I will show a little uh, view later. This um, Saint Foy in Conk, uh, the facade on the right, that itself is mostly 18th century. But then the interior remains very uh, typical Romanesque. And uh, very uh, elegantly proportioned and uh, nobly proportioned, very tall space. Uh, that's the crossing that uh, I'm showing on the right. And um, on the left, uh, this ambulatory, and all the grill work is uh, built from the shackles that the prisoners donated on their pilgrimage to the shrine. And uh, with the Saint Foy, again, there's a, 
small town in Alsace called Celestat. There is a shrine of uh, Saint Foy. And again, there was uh, some sacred theft. <laughs> so these um, abbeys and the churches, and they sometimes they lose by theft and then they reclaim it. Then they do a bargaining and then um, get some compensation later. Uh, this is Toulouse, uh, southwestern city of Toulouse. Now it is, uh, of course, industrial city, the home of uh, Airbus industry. But then I think um, uh, Saint Sernin, uh, Saturnin Saint Sernin uh, in Toulouse is um, together with Santiago de Compostela, uh, the most important pilgrimage church. Um, you know, among of, of France and uh, Spain. So uh, I show the uh, Eastern Shui uh, on the right and how logically organized and a little sort of a Gothic uh, ambition of a, doing a crossing tower very tall. On the left is a double aisle a Romanesque structure and the facade not following what's happening inside, but then making one, one sloped facade. And uh, the Western facade, I must uh, say, personally, I find it a little awkward. The inside, I think one of the best Romanesque. I added a chapter dealing with the two churches in Pyrenees, uh, the present day France, but then during the Middle Ages, before the, the nationhood of Spain or France were not uh, really distinguished, uh, what was built in the Pyrene, I show uh, in town of Codale, Saint Michel de Cusha. And uh, the nave on the inside shows uh, the wooden uh, truss, but then what began as a horseshoe arch in the Mozarabic uh, manner was later uh, restored to be a semi-circular uh, arch. That's what is important about the photograph on the right. And uh, the uh, view from north, uh, southeast, the sort of uh, radiating chapels we discern immediately, and then rather sculptural Massing of the whole ensemble. There is a horseshoe arch which was in the process, which was in the process of being straightened out on the left. And um, this um, Saint Michel de Crucia, it was left in ruins for many decades, and uh, the Rockefeller family bought good portion of the cloister and then moved it to New York. And the, what is uh, rebuilt as uh, the cloisters in the northern, uh, you know, uh, northern end of uh, New York, uh, the cloisters is from uh, Saint Michel de Cusha. Uh, this is a little more, um, sort of a more interesting uh, sort of a Pirene Catalan Romanesque uh, in a town named Castell. And uh, in order to get to the um, monastery, you have to hire a four wheel drive. And uh, the driver actually uh, 
as he moves the passenger, he has to stop and make a, a sort of a turn in the middle of uh, several turns. A very scary place. But then once you are up there, amazing uh, picture of um, uh, Saint Martin. And a very, a very modest, early Romanesque. Uh, and uh, what is curious about this uh, Saint Martin is um, column has an emphasis. And uh, it seems to indicate some influence from uh, Greek architecture. But then the uh, arch and the masonry above is very, uh, very primitive and a very small nave, as we can see on the left. And uh, it was left in you know ruins for you know over a century, and uh, during the late nineteenth century and uh, into. Uh, first decades of the 20th century, a French government uh, restored it, but then the restoration architect uh, chose to organize it, not in the original form, but the reconfigured so that uh, some of the colonies were facing uh, south orientation on the right. And the, one of the, um, highly regarded uh, column, a capital. And uh, that we can see is not from, uh, you know, one of the uh, biblical stories, but then I think the stone cover as well as the master mason uh, sort of um, uh, took a flight of fancy, <laughs> and created an amazing uh, set of uh, capitals. I believe that is, probably what I have prepared. And here I just uh, show you a bit of <laughs> some of the things that uh, while you travel, you cannot miss, uh, you know, amazing uh, gourmet food. <laughs> so that's my presentation. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Faisal. That was marvelous. <laughs> yeah, let me. Well, hey, that was fantastic. Um, let's give another round of applause. If that's a good. Uh, I just wanted to take a very, very brief moment to say thank you all for being here. Uh, we really genuinely enjoy uh, these events that are so collaborative where we've got people from, you know, advancement and the Vandercook School of Music and the Mies Society, the College of Architecture. It is truly amazing the people that we get together with. So um, thank you all very much. The Mies Society has got many, many events coming up. Um, our next event will be Hilbs Day, which I think is November 27th or 17th? 16th. 16th. And uh, that will be the day we celebrate the uh, shortest day of the year, not on the shortest day of the year. We used to do it on the shore of the day of the year, but there was never anybody on campus that day. So we've decided to move it up a month. So that'll be another wonderful evening with uh, with entertainment and, and some discussions and maybe a presentation or two. Um, and then uh, in the uh, spring, uh, we'll have the Mies birthday party. And this year's birthday parties can be a little bit different. Um, there'll be details to follow, but uh, rather than a Crown Hall event, it's gonna be an arts club event. So uh, that'll allow many of our alum that uh, have a hard time getting all the way down to Crown Hall from the loop, um, a little bit easier go of it. So uh, thank you all. Thank you all for being here and thank you for your support. We'll look forward to uh, seeing you next time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> thank you.